the title of today's webinar is Body Stressing Musculoskeletal Disorders and Good Work Design. And you might be wondering why we've grouped these things together. Body stressing injuries consistently remain the leading contributing factor to workplace harm across the ComCare scheme, with 42% of all accepted injury claims in 2020-2021 identifying body stressing as the key mechanism of injury. In January this year, Safe Work Australia released their report on key work health and safety statistics for Australia. And that recognised that body stressing accounts for 37% of all claims in Australia in 2020-2021. So it's not only a national issue, but it's very um, close to home for ComCare as well. So body stressing includes both low intensity muscle, uh, repetitive muscle loading and movements, as well as more strenuous high intensity activities. And we know that body stressing can result in a range of musculoskeletal disorders. Our data indicates that some of the common activities in body stressing related musculoskeletal disorders are manual handling and computer weight related work. However, we also know that this isn't all of the story. And if we look back from the injury, back towards the causal factors, we often see a range of other biological and psychosocial factors at play that make a key role in causing these uh, injuries or causing this harm. So we recognise that there's also upstream opportunities in the design of work, in the tasks, the activities and the processes and how they're put together that can help prevent harm and increase job satisfaction, and enhance worker wellbeing. So joining me today to discuss and explore some of these issues, we have Professor Jody Oakman, who's the head of the Centre of Ergonomics and Human Factors at La Trobe University. And Jody's going to discuss some of the latest research findings and resources to optimise employee physical and mental wellbeing. We've got Melanie Anson, who's Head of Rehabilitation for Australia Post, who's going to be sharing some examples of how injury management data and insights can inform and support practical injury prevention approaches and initiatives. And following this, we'll have Lynn Gunning, who's Director of Strategic Programs at Comcare, who will provide context and walk us through some of the ComCare's resources and guidance around good work design. After the presentations, we'll have a panel discussion with a focus on practice in action, what works, what doesn't work, and what we can do better. We're also really pleased to have received a lot of questions through the registration process, and we've actually done our best to consolidate these into questions that we'll be put into our presenters today. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all of them because there were so many, but I can really assure you that none of the questions are wasted. Whether we directly address them or not, they help inform our guidance materials, future event and content that we develop for you. So, as I mentioned earlier, you're really welcome to participate in the conversation uh, with the rest of the audience through the chat function uh, across the forum. So feel free to post your questions and comments. We'd also love to get your feedback on the webinar. Uh, and as I mentioned before, there will be that quick survey at the end, uh, which you can fill out and share in your thoughts uh, and ideas for future sessions. So we really hope that today's session's enjoyable, provides you with some valuable insights that you can take back to your workplace. Uh, and the information and resources we share can support you in creating safer and healthier workplaces. So interesting, the uh, biggest hazards I can see there, we've got uh, lots of sitting, uh, work, uh, manual handling, bad posture, prolonged sitting, poor, poor ergonomics, poor techniques, repetitive strain and manual tasks, workstation ergonomics. Really interesting. So the last poll that we're going to put up before we really kick off and get started is around what risk assessment tools that you're currently using or not using to identify body stressing risks? I tend to just pop those up there now. And while you're popping in those responses, I'm going to introduce Jody. So Professor Jody Oakman, who's head of the Centre of Ergonomics and Human Factors at La Trobe University. Jody's an ergonomist and a human factors specialist who's worked in a range of industry settings before moving into academia. Her research programs focused on working with organisations to optimise employees' physical and mental health. She led the development of a Participative Hazard Identification and Risk Management Toolkit, or a FIRM for short, 
which has been designed to support organisations in reducing stress-related mental health and musculoskeletal disorders through using a participative approach. So I'll now hand over to Jody Oakman for a presentation and discussion of some of the poll results as well. So we've got some results coming up in there. Hello and, and welcome. I'm delighted to be able to speak uh, to you today on one of my favourite topics, uh, my, uh, research and musculoskeletal disorders, and hopefully challenge some of those uh, assumptions that people have about what's required for prevention programs. I, um, uh, I'm in central Victoria, so in Jaja land, and I'd like to also extend my, um, uh, I'd like to pay my respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging, and any Indigenous participants joining us today. So what I'm going to talk about today is not just about musculoskeletal disorders, because I really want to challenge, we've been, uh, shall we say, stuck really in prevention of MSDs at about the same level for quite a long time. So clearly, I think, and the research would suggest, there are opportunities for us as WHS professionals and organisations, the organisations with which we deal with, to improve our risk management of MSDs. And to do that, I, need, I think we need to think about uh, yes, the extent of the problem, but I think we all know that, and I'm not going to dwell on that at all. But actually, the Australian workforce landscape and implications for WHS uh, practice, if you listen to any media at, at, um, at present, you will see, you'll, you'll note that we're in, we're in interesting circumstances. We've got a number of challenges that directly influence our practice as WHS professionals. Why does the, I'll, I'll try and uh, provide some thoughts about why does uh, the MSD problem persist, persist and about the current tools for MSD prevention. And of course, I'm going to talk about a firm because uh, we developed the, uh, the toolkit. So uh, in talking about MSDs, so there's the uh, biases declared. Um, and then about what sort of actions we might need to think about. So, 27% of the population have a chronic musculoskeletal disorder problem um, and the rate goes up with older, um, older people and women. And I am often asked, I gave a presentation yesterday uh, to, to um, a group and I'm always asked about the ageing workforce um, and how do we make sure we've got uh, work for older workers or design work for older workers and my response is more or less the same. You can't change that. The problem is going to get worse and if we actually take the focus off the older workers and look at sustainability across the life course, then we, pre we provide, uh, we support new workers coming in and, and, and enable them to extend those work for, um, extend their working lives. It's not that simple. I, I I recognise that. Um, uh, but workplace hazard exposures are a major contributor to these pain, to, to musculoskeletal pain. Of course, there are outside work and there are inside work hazards. We as WHS professionals can only focus on those things within work, the work situation. It is an enormous problem and uh, you will hear my frustration <laughs> at several times throughout um, the presentation at the lack of focus and the lack of financial funding for research in this area, given that it is the leading cause, it's the third leading cause, total burden of disease, next to coronary heart disease and dementia. But if we look at the funding towards uh, occupational health issues, it is dismal. So anyone out there who has any influence, hear that um, frustration and see what you can uh, scrounge around in your bottom drawers, please. Uh, because there are, we have significant gaps in our research uh, knowledge and particular Australia fares particularly poorly in occupational health good quality research. So there's the, there's the, the um, state of play as I see it with my research hat on. Um, and the importance of this musculoskeletal disorder problems are that they result in early exit from work, 
impact productivity and they are significant societal burden. And as our population ages, this, pro this will get uh, more significant. So a couple of, a month or so ago, uh, the Working Future report was released by Treasury. Our, uh, our Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, was out spruiking about what this report was going to do and what it stated. And you might think, oh, what she took, why is this relevant to today? Um, if anyone uh, has a bit of spare time, they might want to read uh, the report or you could just listen here and there's a couple of sections that are particularly relevant to WHS professionals. It of course talks about the ageing workforce and the change in distribution of jobs. So we know anyone working in um, WHS knows that manufacturing is on the decline. Um, but also the sort of work within manufacturing that's been undertaken, uh, the construct of that work is also changing. So the heavy manual work uh, in, in some and not all places is reducing, often in, but often uh, an increase in the sort of cognitive aspects where people are dealing with uh, combined automation or um, of robotics. But we're seeing a, an increase in, in work that is non-routine um, and with high cognitive challenges. I just um, pause there to say one of the things that we can become distracted by is thinking more about white collar work, um, particularly in the last few years with a focus on working from home. Physical work still exists. Um, and physical, those, uh, the challenges for people in those sorts of roles are really significant and uh, because the often people in those roles have um, uh, more constrained circumstances, it's more difficult for them to move into other roles if they become injured. So we need to be very careful not to take the focus off improving those, those jobs as well. The modes of employment that we have, the um, huge rise in the gig, gig economy and the lack of protections in that sort of work are really significant. Uh, we all know everyone in every sector uh, is grappling with AI. Um, academia um, is, is uh, facing, uh, trying to work out how to, uh, how to use AI in a, in a positive sense. We've got robotics and increasing automation, uh, which is often good but has a set of challenges with it. So it's a, there are some really interesting insights and I think we need to be thinking about what are the implications of this for our practice and are we as WHS professionals adequately skilled to, um, to grapple with these big, big issues. Where workers will be working um, is, uh, is, is something that we need to be, uh, to be thinking about. And the aged care sector, not surprisingly, will be an increasingly large employer, uh, despite the fact that we have a massive retention problem there, which is discussed um, it, within the report uh, and music to my ears. It, it talks about the sort of factors that we need to think about if we're going to improve the retention problem. And these are all centred around job design. So Lynn will talk about these uh, later on this morning. But things like security, quality of work, job demands. One of the challenges in 2015, um, I undertook a project doing some pilot testing for a firm in the aged care sector. We made some good changes to different aspects of people work. We're really trying to unpack the psychosocial hazards and the physical hazards uh, in the workload. I left that project um, relieved because it's a very difficult um, sector to work in, but also frustrated. And my sense was I was not going to do work in that sector unless we could do something structural about the job design issues. And this is, you know, seven or eight years ago. Just uh, uh, about five or six years later, I was asked to do a um, a systems analysis of work in the aged care sector. And of course I went, great, that's that's exactly what I want, want to do. And um, what we did was we actually looked at what are the different influences on worker safety in, in aged care. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, most of the focus or nearly all of the focus in aged care is actually on the resident. Resident safety, resident outcomes, quality of care, uh, which means there's much less focus despite a whole lot of uh, regulation within, in which uh, the sector operates. 
So what this means is that that uh, the the worker is not given sufficient focus in terms of health and safety. And so this project finished in March 2020. And if you cast your mind back to what you were doing in March 2020, most of us went home. Um, and in Melbourne, we stayed home for a very uh, long time. But what we saw unfold was a catastrophe in aged care, and most of which was entirely predictable. And a, and a lot of those issues were around work health and safety issues. So we have a lot of work to do in that sector. And I think I'm hoping that the aged care um, uh, uh, Royal Commission will actually drive, you know, some of that structural change that's needed. But uh, we are going to need to address those workforce um, shortage issues um, urgently. So the, the last bit of, of that report I want to um, point towards is, is, the, uh, is section six. So you only need to read a few sections, um, which talks about overcoming barriers to employment and broadening opportunities. But when you actually read in the, in the report, it talks about job design can allow more people to participate. Uh, the role for employers to address participation barriers, helping mature age workers remain in the workplace for longer, I mean, these are things we've known about for a long time, um, and supporting people with disability or health conditions to work to their capacity. So these are really important issues and highly relevant uh, to, uh, to, to WHS uh, professionals and really consistent with our thinking around good, uh, good design principles. So most of you here, oh, there's a lot of you. I won't look at that number. Most of you um, in the uh, in in this in, in this room will be really familiar, I think, with the the uh, etiology of MSDs. But just bear with me while I give you the the really brief uh, snapshot. They're caused by exposure to manual handling or physical hazards that we're really comfortable. We know what they are, and these psychosocial hazards. This is not new. I was in a presentation a couple of weeks ago, and there was a, a nod to this being equivocal or, you know, still not certain. Let me be really clear. This, there is plenty of research evidence to support the dual role of these, um, of, of these pathways to MSD development. And most, we've known about this since the 1980s. The issue, the, the, the really, uh, the, 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 um, they, we're seeing an increasing focus at the minute, in part driven by the psychosocial regs that are coming out across all states, perhaps not my own as yet, but um, uh, which is which is great. But this is a long way behind the research evidence. So this, just to, re, to just to reiterate, this is not new at all. Um, so. In addressing MSD uh, prevention, we really need to take into account that complexity, and I'll talk about that a bit in a minute. So we need to stop the sort of linear transactional approach that we've, where, um, we have used traditionally and say, well, okay, this is really messy. There's lots of things that uh, result in um, increased MSD risk, and therefore our prevention programs need to be sufficiently comprehensive to uh, to deal with those hazards um, up uh, those upstream hazards I'm also going to suggest that perhaps we reduce our focus from the outcome um, from uh, stress related mental health or MSDs and we focus on what are the causes because if we do that the health the the, the, uh, the health outcomes or the adverse health outcomes that result as uh, due to exposure to for those hazardous work conditions, um, they're not secondary, but they they will. There are many uh, things that arise from exposure, and so if we deal with the exposures, then we will uh, reap the benefit um, with those uh, with improved health outcomes. So the psychosocial hazards are. Uh, many we can there is a, a long list of those psychosocial hazards and um, I'll talk more about that uh, later on and the complexities around um, evidence in um, in those uh, psychosocial hazards um, compared to physical hazards where we could really contain those to about a list of 12 
um, you know, force, repetition, etc. But the psychosocial hazards are, are, are vast and how they are measured uh, varies um, greatly depending on what sort of measure that you use. But they do see it, we, we can perhaps consider them around the organisational factors, so, so those issues around job design, working hours, how much control people have, and then these social context issues around the sort of culture, um, how we get on with our man managers and our, our supervisors. So, if we think about this etiology and we think about the sort of broader landscape that we're working in, it suggests that we need to be thinking about how this influences what's happening at an individual worker level. And so in order to do that, we need to think about systems and we need to think about these interacting parts and that these are not only the sum of their parts, but they're product of your interaction. And interactions are really crucial in terms of these complex etiologies like MSDs and stress-related mental health. So in, in simple, you know, in the, in the sort of uh, elevator pitch on systems thinking, um, what we, ne what we need to think about is, is what systems thinking helps us with, is thinking about what does it influence and what influences it. But in a uh, nutshell, we need to be seeking sort of multiple perspectives about the particular problem that we're trying to solve to help identify what are the sort of gaps and processes and procedures and things that are occurring in that particular system that might make it worse or improve it. And so changing our focus from looking down at the particular problem, so the MSD problem, to looking up and out at what, what are these other things which are influencing what happens. So this leads me to think about sort of complexity and complex. And increasingly, we're developing an understanding of complex systems. But one of the challenges is in translating this research knowledge into practice and how this influences our WHS uh, you know, practice. So in WHS, we often take a systematic approach. You know, we identify there's a problem or there's an incident and then we go and we look at it very methodically, entirely appropriate. But what that can do is take our eye off what are the other problems within the system that we need to deal with. And so uh, we need to remind ourselves, I think, that beyond this sort of linear approach, that we need to be addressing that complexity and looking at the sort of systems and mechanisms and tools that we use um, to ensure that they're able to cope uh, to cope with that or guide us in that sort of thinking. And it doesn't mean that we throw out systematic or we use uh, systemic sort of thinking. In WHS, it's entirely appropriate to use a combination of both. Um, and I think we find that sometimes we, you know, we need to shift between the two and find a, a, the sweet spot in the Venn diagram. So if we accept that physical and psychosocial hazards are important, the other question I often get asked is, yeah, but really it's the physical hazards that are the bigger problem. And if we deal with that, then, then we'll, you know, likely to solve the problem. And that, to a certain extent, might be true. Uh, you'll solve some of the problem uh, and you might solve it for a period of time. But if we think about that sort of interaction effect, what that will tell us is that that problem is likely to come back. And I'm sure that if you'll reflect on your practice, you'll think, well, OK, we did sort that out. And then a period of time later, three, six, 12 months, problems re, um, return because we haven't addressed the complexity. Now, I haven't got time today to go through uh, this, uh, these particular uh, papers uh, in detail, but just to show you that um, effects of psychosocial hazards matter. Now, one of the challenges, though, is that often in, uh, say, systematic reviews, such as I'm presenting here, uh, for whatever reason, reviewers choose to look at either the physical hazards and the impact of those on MSDs 
or they look at the psychosocial hazards, but not together. So uh, my team, <laughs> I decided that uh, we would tackle this for, um, for, my, uh, for, for my skins to try and look at what are the effects of psychosocial and physical hazards together. What research had been done, which looked at longitudinal studies, so studies which measured um, pain or people had pain at zero and then they developed pain, and what were the relative impacts of psychosocial and physical hazards? Um, anyone that's done a review before or um, has, has read reviews will understand that this was um, a, quite a complex process to try and weed out how we were actually going to think about these psychosocial hazards in a meaningful way. For the physical hazards, it's relatively straightforward. We can group those into uh, things about whole body or hand and fingers or, or mixed. But for psychosocial hazards, there are a lot of um, psychosocial hazards and they're measured very differently. So we had to find a way to actually put them together in a, um, a robust way. And I won't explain that in, in detail. It will be in the paper, which is um, in preparation and hopefully uh, published next year. But in a nutshell, um, both the biomechanical and the psychosocial hazards were associated with um, different body regions. Um, and the biomechanical uh, hazards were more strongly uh, associated. So therefore, the, 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 that will um, reassure the people who uh, um, believe that the physical hazards are, are, are more important. But to take that without actually thinking about it further is actually to, to simplify it. One of the challenges and perhaps a limitation of this review is the fact that there's this big wide spread of, psychoso of psychosocial hazards that were not as uh, definitively or uh, measured as the physical hazards. So it's not surprising we get a stronger effect size for those physical hazards. So much as I would love the data to to, to provide these with a with with a match, and we see that in real world intervention data. But once we pulled the results, that big messy spread of psychosocial hazards really influences those results. But nonetheless, the psychosocial and the physical hazards are both important for many of the body regions. So one of the ways that we uh, categorised that data was actually using our own Australian data, which um, I hope that makes um, people uh, happy because we are thin on the ground on available uh, data on Australian workplaces um, in, in terms of physical and psychosocial hazards. Um, mostly we look to Northern Europe who have very um, um, good quality longitudinal studies um, and uh, a thing called register data, which we don't have. So anyway, this, this is from our Affirm Toolkit data. We looked at nearly 2,300 um, workers from 33 workplaces in, in, with high risk, uh, high MSD risk. And really the, take, the, the message I wanna to convey today is that the most variability we saw in those, in, in those uh, results was in the um, psychosocial hazards. And in in terms of thinking about what that actually means for practitioners, what that means is that you're likely to achieve the greatest benefit in MSD prevention through targeting those psychosocial hazards as opposed to the physical hazards. And we think, we can only um, uh, hypothesise, that because workplaces often have programs in place to address the physical hazards, they're that, and particularly in these high-risk industry sectors, that mostly they've got controls in place that are likely, uh, you know, likely to be working. And so the opportunity exists in terms of the psychosocial hazards. So there's a plug for, for doing something differently. So we said at the top of the, um, uh, at, the uh, at the start, we asked people about, um, people in the audience here, about what tools they were using. Now I can't see those uh, those results, but I'll tell you about what we found when we talked to, to um, WHS practitioners about what they were using in tools. Now, these are in-depth interviews, so not big numbers, but we got to talk to people uh, at, at length 
uh, about what sort of tools they were using and approaches. And this report, this, this was funded by the um, Centre for, uh, for Work Health and Safety in New South Wales. This report's available on their website, so I, I don't, uh, you can uh, read it. You've got quite a bit of homework now, haven't you? But the, the key message is that in many workplaces, they're not really using um, uh, many tools. People were aware uh, of some tools, but that but the tools that were, they were actually implementing were uh, sorry back here um, were not uh, they weren't being widely implemented. I'm getting tongue tied here. So if we look at the number of validated tools that workplaces were actually using out of our sample of 29, only um, uh, uh, we had about uh, a third of them were actually using a tool. So two thirds of them were not doing, um, they weren't, weren't actively doing anything at that point in time. And if they were, they weren't using, uh, weren't using a tool. So what the other part of that project was to actually look at what tools are available to uh, practitioners, freely available to practitioners that you're able to use in your workplaces. And we did an a, a, a extensive review of all the, all the tools that were available, that were published, that there was information that we could get. And then we made a matrix, we developed a matrix uh, of those for as physical tools or psychosocial tools or comprehensive tools. Now to be a comprehensive tool, you needed to be, this is for MSD prevention, you needed to be identifying physical, psychosocial hazards, and provide support through the whole range of the risk management cycle. And there were three tools left, um, uh, a firm, the NASA TLX, and the quick exposure checklist. Um, a firm is the only tool uh, in, in Australia, and it was by far, we didn't grade the degrees of comprehensiveness, um, but it was by far the most comprehensive tool with the largest range of hazards included in the hazard identification process. Okay, so I hope from this uh, that this challenges you to, to think about how you conceptualise and then implement your risk management programs for musculoskeletal disorders. Um, because I think uh, the, the evidence that we're seeing and getting uh, what, what is happening at workplace risk management level, getting data on that is actually very, uh, very difficult. Um, so I'm going to move forward. I might skip over the video. I think I've just moved. Okay. So one of the um, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the development of the Affirm Toolkit. I'm sure that some of you in the room are probably aware of that, and I'm going to point you to some resources that you can um, you can go to to just to to, uh, to find out further information but based on what I've been talking about this morning um, and you know working um, in the this space for for a long time we developed the toolkit uh, to address the current gaps in risk management strategies to, to bring together those physical and psychosocial hazards when we started this work in early 2000s this was very difficult ground to try and convince people that there was a need to actually do this. It's much easier now um, because uh, be because the um, evidence is more widely uh, e accepted. So there's a number of uh, barriers that we identified, insufficient focus on psychosocial hazards, insufficient levels of worker participation, so that consultation piece, and a focus on this linear transactional approach. So we developed the toolkit to address those um, evidence to practice gaps. So, you know, it's a systems-based tool um, that uh, brings together the physical and psychosocial workplace hazards, highly participative, and provides support through a risk management cycle. And it provides benchmarking data to measure within organisations improvement from, um, from the first uh, iteration be, um, before development of risk controls and then after, and also intersector um, uh, benchmarking. So we have a new feature uh, available. You can find more information on, the, um, on, on our 
our website and there is a range of videos around the toolkit and what it does. And it's recently been expanded to include uh, prevention of stress-related mental health. Because if we focus on the upstream uh, hazardous conditions, those conditions that uh, arise in the psychosocial work environment that are relevant to stress-related mental health are the same as for MSDs. Um, as I said, it, uh, it follows a risk management cycle, so it um, people and it provides support and resources at each step of the way. Uh, and all of the uh, data is, is, about, is, is collected in the one spot. So it makes it easy for organisations which might have turnover so that uh, the data is all contained within the toolkit. All right. Um, just kind of, I'm just mindful of the time. Um, just to uh, just to say, we've got nearly a thousand people registered for the uh, on the uh, toolkit, so they've expressed interest in doing that. We have 126 organisations actively using that, and they might be using it across a number of different sites, but actually organisations using it. And we've got some organisations that are testing, thinking about what to actually do. And there's there's about 500 who are test who who are looking, but not sure right yet. So in terms of they're, uh, they're contemplating what their next moves might be. All right, I'm going to um, finish up here. Um, so I just want to finish with saying, for WH professionals, I want you to, I would encourage you to think, what is your organisation doing to address psychosocial hazards and MSDs? And does it fit with that uh, need for taking a really comprehensive approach and do you and me, do we have the skills and knowledge that we need to effectively manage um, MSD? And if not, or, or if you do, what changes might you need to make? And in terms of the research landscape, we need evaluation of interventions. This is a really, um, a, a, there is a big dearth of research in this, in this particular area. So, and we need a range of cost studies, in, uh, sorry, case studies, including cost benefits in Australian um, organisations. On our website, we have um, uh, some uh, case studies on the use of the Affirm Toolkit, and these are available on our website and through the uh, WorkSafe, Victoria, uh, um, WorkSafe Victoria website. More information, go to the Toolkit and, and uh, go to our website and register your interest. And thank you for um, listening to me this morning. Thanks so much, Jody, for such an interesting and informative presentation. And um, sorry you couldn't see the results of that poll, which are in the chat there. Uh, you might be interested to know that just over 50% of people were not currently using a tool. So there's a range of other tools, uh, with some using the Affirm tool, uh, but a range of others, including people at work uh, and the Perform Participative ergonomics uh, for manual tasks uh, tools are uh, being used. Next, we've got Melanie Anson. Uh, as I mentioned, Melanie is the head of rehabilitation for Australia Post, and which is possibly Australia's most iconic logistics and integrated services business. Melanie's responsible for leading a team of in-house workplace rehabilitation providers who offer rehabilit occupational rehabilitation services to a 35,000 strong workforce nationally. She's been with Australia Post for uh, the last 14 years, working across rehabilitation and workers' compensation arenas. Prior to that, she's got a further 10 years experience working in insurance, risk management and occupational rehabilitation. Melanie's a registered psychologist who's passionate about optimising mental health and wellbeing in the workplace. So today, Mel's going to be providing some examples of how injury management data and insights can inform and support practical injury prevention approaches and initiatives. So over to you, Mel. Thanks so much, Andrew, and I'm pleased to be here with you all. Um, I really wanted to talk today around um, the, the potential of using workers' comp data to assist um, and drive work health and safety um, processes and, and, and focus areas. Uh, we ran a project uh, for the last 12 months or so that really was born out of 
a discussion I had with someone from our, our internal rehabilitation team who uh, manages lots of different parts of the business. But um, one of those parts of the business was our transport side of things. And and he came to me and had a discussion around, he said, it's, it's starting to bother me when I'm looking at the injuries that are coming through that I'm finding they're becoming quite predictable. Um, so compared to other areas of the business where we get lots of different things coming in, um, he said to me, I feel like I can, especially when someone new starts, um, nearly predict what type of injury they're going to have, you know, within the next 12 to 24 months. So um, that that was really interesting to me. And so what we did was do a bit of a deep dive into the data specifically for the transport side of our business. Um, and I think the importance for me in that is that from the, the work health safety data and the actual incidents we were having, there wasn't particularly um, a highlight on transport. We weren't having a higher proportion um, of incidents or injuries coming from that part of our business. But what the workers' comp data told us, the really interesting story that it told was that the numbers weren't higher, but we were having significantly higher costs and we were having a lot more of the same type of injuries coming through. So one example really was, um, was shoulder injuries were... Um, a double within the transport side of the business to what they were um, from the sorting or the logistics side of things. Um, and we were getting a lot more lower limb injuries. Um, those shoulder injuries were costing on average triple what our average claims costs were. Um, and so really that workers' comp data backed up um, that the the conversation and what the rehabilitation team were finding that we were getting a lot more consistency in those injuries. And so um, what we endeavoured to do with our project was really look at what different parts of the businesses um, were doing um, as far as finding the right people, induction, pre-employment screening, um, all the way through to injury management and seeing how we could potentially bring all of that together. What we found is that um, individually those different parts of the business were doing really good work, but there wasn't anyone looking at it uh, end to end. And that's what we endeavoured to do with this project is a bit of an end to end analysis of where the gaps might be that were leading to these um, more high cost, high impact injuries that we were having in the transport um, side of the business. Rehabilitation took that on, but I really feel like that could come um, from HR, from the uh, wealth, work, health and safety professionals of just getting everyone at the table together and undertaking that analysis beginning to end. Because we did find that while good work was happening, a lot of people weren't talking to each other um, throughout that process. So the predictability and the consistency of those injuries was really our primary concern. Um, I, we really started without looking at our pre-employments and seeing how tailored they were to the actual tasks that were being undertaken in the transport side of the business. So we wanted to know how well that was working. Um, so I sent two of my young fit rehab guys um, a little bit undercover to have a, a pre-employment assessment done. Um, and they came back uh, telling me in no uncertain terms how sore they were the next day and how absolutely comprehensive that pre-employment um, part of the process was. So that was a big tick for us that, um, that that was being done well. The first pinch point really came when we talked to our recruitment team who in no uncertain terms said to us, please don't make this process any more difficult because it's so difficult um, to attract and retain um, truck drivers. And so please don't put anything in this process. It's going to make our lives any more harder. So um, the recruitment challenges within an ageing workforce was definitely um, the first sort of red flag for us around. We were getting much, much older um, uh, candidates coming through and we really weren't. One of the first things we sort of um, came up with as a group is how we could encourage more diversity into those um, roles. Definitely those older experienced workers uh, were important, but also we had lots of um, keen uh, younger people in the business who didn't have their truck licences. So we really wanted to look at um, what were the challenges to them getting that and is that something that could be assisted uh, uh, through the business. Um, 
another real red flag for us was how many people were injuring themselves uh, within that first six to 12 months of employment with Australia Post in, in a transport role. Um, and again, we were seeing lots of shoulder and lots of um, upper limb injuries. Um, and so the rehabilitation team worked really closely with the, not only the recruitment, but also the training team. And we've now put in place um, a six week physical induction as part of um, a, a general induction into that truck driving role. So really looking at um, the task analysis that we had um, already had in place for this role and really breaking down what the physical requirements are and then building a uh, six week, real, really a work conditioning program that definitely wasn't designed to be pass or fail. It wasn't part of someone's, um, you know, 12 week, are we suitable for this role or not? It was really around um, where, where are the gaps potentially from a physical perspective between um, where we were with the pre-employments, but what the physical requirements of that role were um, and giving people the skills to really physically get up to um, scratch of where they needed to be within those six weeks. And within the six weeks, if they didn't get there, then we added some additional support in from there. Um, and I can't give you the results on that because we've just put that in place in the last few months, um, but it's been very popular and something that um, our new recruits have really taken on board. So um, that was one part of the process where we took that workers' comp data and said, all right, if we know people are injuring themselves more within that first 12 months, what practical supports can we put in place to um, reduce uh, those injuries? Um, I'll just flick to the next screen, which really... Um, so I've covered off sort of the recruitment and the induction side of things. We're also looking at putting together some periodic um, physical assessments. So again, nothing around um, fitness to do the role, um, but more around looking at it from a biomechanical perspective and where might people need some additional work conditioning support um, throughout their lifetime as a driver uh, with Australia Post. We had a look at our plant and equipment. So we really had a look at uh, uh, sort of a cross check in our workers comp data around were there certain models or types of trucks where people were having um, more injuries and more costly injuries um, than other types. Um, we sent all of our uh, rehab staff out uh, for a day to sit in a truck and, and do a run. And we that was really important for us to um, add that sort of evidence to the actual workers' comp data that we had coming through because what we really found was when we visited the yard that there was on any given day potentially 20 different models of trucks and and, and talking to the the drivers, you know, they, they showed us that the, the, the gap between the bottom step and the ground could be as as much of a difference as about 50 centimetres, depending on which truck they had for the day. And often the trucks rotated. Um, you just grab the keys and have a different truck every day. And so a lot of them were saying um, that those lower limb injuries were really come from um, that lack of thinking about what type of truck am I on? And when I step up, am I taking a small step or am I going to need to take a really large step, which was causing people to um, have twists to their knees and their, um, and their ankles. So, you know, I think adding sort of the workers' comp data, the injury management data, but then actually really talking to people gave us a really clear idea of why was we were seeing this consistency um, in the injuries that were coming through. Um, the other really important thing we got from talking to people was um, we had some great aids and equipment for people to use. Um, and when we noticed that no one was using them, we asked them about it and um, someone at some stage had ordered them and they were still, you know, sitting in a box, box gathering dust at some of our facilities and were being really well used at other facilities. So nationally getting some consistency around um, training, letting people know that they were there, why they were useful, um, has been really useful in trying to keep down particularly our shoulder injuries. And we were seeing not just expensive injuries come through, but really quite life altering um, injuries. Anyone that's had a shoulder injury knows they can be particularly um, painful and can take a, a fair amount of time to um, recover from. So um, getting some of those stories out there and really um, championing the use of these aids and equipment um, was an interesting 
uh, part of the project and really letting us know we can't just tick a box from a, well, this is available, but people aren't using it, really getting them to tell us why they weren't using it and making some alterations from there. And then the last thing we really looked at as part of this key focus area was um, our entry management pathways. So for truck drivers particularly, um, anyone who works in this area will know it's a particularly difficult area to um, find ongoing suitable duties for. Um, and most truck drivers really just want to be in trucks. So um, we've really worked in the last six to 12 months on what some alternative pathways within the business are. Um, and that might be working in vans rather than in trucks. But for people that have ongoing um, restrictions because of their injuries, what can we potentially do um, to assist them to be able to manage their injury ongoing, but also from a mental health perspective, feel productive and, and still be part of the business, but not always trying to get them back into that pre-injury role, which is where they um, they injured themselves to start with. So um, that's just my really uh, quick overview of, of this project we ran. For me, the real key learnings out of this have been the importance of trying to pull di these different groups together. Again, there was some really great work happening, but it was it was happening in isolation. And I think that ability to pull it all together has led to a much better outcome for us in a uh, a really strategic approach to the the end-to-end -end process rather than everybody looking at their own um, their own sections. And I would really encourage you to use your workers' comp um, data as well as your WHS data because I do think that it provides um, a much richer data source, but it also um, it, it allows you to learn from uh, what you've seen previously and really integrate that into your uh, work health safety processes. So for us, it's been a really worthwhile um, activity and it's probably something we're now we're going to look at doing at um, different parts of the business. But for us, transport was a really um, obvious place to start. So. Um, Thank you for the ability um, to share this with you. Um, wellbeing, safety, injury management, really they're the three key areas that we were looking at pulling together. Um, and uh, we had a much better project for it rather than just trying to stick to one area. So thank you, Andrew. I will hand back to you. Right. Thanks, Mel. And it's really great to hear this information from an employer's perspective and ground it in some of the operational uh, realities. Uh, being able to see how injury management data and insights can actually inform approaches towards injury prevention and the design of work as part of Australia's post approach to sort of reducing harm and increasing the health and wellbeing of your workers. So next up, we've got Lynn Gunning. Uh, Lynn is an engaging and strategic leader with over 20 years experience in workplace health and safety. Uh, project management and stakeholder engagement. In her role as a Director of Strategic Programs at ComQ, Lynn's responsible for designing and implementing initiatives, developing tools and guidance for employers to improve worker health, safety, wellbeing and participation, collaborating with stakeholders to improve good work design, reduce sedentary work practices and promote workplace mental health. Lynn's going to be providing some context and walking us through some of the resources that ComCare has around good work design to address physical and psychosocial hazards. So, Lynn, over to you. Um, thanks, Andrew. And I mean, Mel's really showcased, I guess, really the importance of thorough assessment there and identifying sources of risk and, and also that the importance of, of consultation. And um, I think Jodie's also set me up very well to speak, um, highlighting that, you know, the contribution of some of those psychosocial hazards out there and, you know, the real importance of, of um, you know, job design and how we actually design uh, good work uh, for, our, um, for our workers. So I'm, I'm really going to build on the messaging um, from uh, Jodie and Melanie and, and talk about good work design and the role it can play in relation to body stressing. So um, certainly Jodie really has talked about how our understanding of body stressing has improved in recent years. And we now know that body stressing is not just about you know, not really not just a product of their physical hazards, but it's closely connected to mental stress and psychosocial hazards. So the psychosocial hazards that may be contributing to body stressing injuries in your workplace include high work demands, low job control, high job strain, uh, low social support, 
low job satisfaction and low job security, among others. Um, there's also evidence now that work or work design or job design can play an important part in preventing body stressing injuries. We know that job design or redesign um, to eliminate or minimise risks associated with manual tech tasks such as heavy lifting um, sits at the top of the hierarchy of controls, which is where efforts in the workplace need to focus first. So Comcast Prevention Strategy um, 2022 to 2025 really identifies body stressing and psychosocial hazards such as work demands as, as priorities. So the strategy adopts elements of the total worker health approach and its goal is really to improve the design of work, management practices and the physical and psychosocial work environment that we're in. So we've delivered new good work design resources that focus on strengthening and supporting the prevention capabilities of managers. So why good work design? So good work design really provides a holistic approach that can address both physical and psychosocial risks. It does this by reducing biomechanical and postural stress, as well as psychosocial stresses, and also by optimising protective psychosocial factors. I'll give you an example. So an organisation makes changes that give their workers more autonomy. In particular, they can now schedule their work tasks in a way that allows them to prioritise important tasks and break up difficult tasks into smaller, more manageable chunks. So this allows each worker to work at their own pace that matches their individual capacity. They can make sure that they get an opportunity to rest and recover after doing effortful work, which we know has a protective effect. As a result, the work of workers feel less physical and mental strain, and they also reap the psychological benefits that come with feeling a high level of control over the work that they're doing. With new psychosocial regulations, we now have a greater focus and increased expectation for effectively addressing psychosocial risks. And we know that people need more support to address this type of hazard and design good work that supports both physical and mental health. The rapid change in when, where and how we work has also prompted a rethink on the capabilities we need our managers and leaders to have. It's more important than ever that managers can design good work for their teams. So what is good work design? So Australia's leading expert, Professor Sharon Parker, talks about how work design considers the content and organisation of people's tasks, activities, relationships and responsibilities. It can be applied to both new and existing work and people at all levels of an organisation can use good work design to assess the quality of work and make changes to support healthier and more productive outcomes. Work design looks at the job from different perspectives, considering physical, biomechanical, cognitive and psychosocial characteristics and what can be improved. We know from research evidence that improvements to things like job satisfaction and job control can have a significant impact on body stressing injuries. You can see from the slide that improving a worker's control over their work can reduce between 37 and 84 per cent of work related risk disorders. Um, and this, um, we can pop the um, research information into the chat from that. I think it's Punnett and Wigan um, 2004 is actually the, um, the citation for that. We have a quick poll question for you now. Um, what do you think are the main causes of body stressing in your workplace? So our good, work, our good Work Design resources overwhelmingly know that um, people's experience at work is shaped by what happens in their teams. So managers and supervisors um, uh, play a critical role in supporting wellbeing by effectively managing psychosocial risks. And we know that they don't always have perhaps those soft skills uh, that are needed. This is why our resources focus on key people management topics like effective communication, building trust, and managing change at work. And this simple guidance on specific behaviours as well. It might look very simple, but actually they are fundamental behaviours to get right. The good news is that the benefits of implementing good work design go far beyond minimising risks. The evidence shows that it affects the health and wellbeing, motivation and job performance of individuals. 
as well as the productivity of teams and organisations. So that again is from um, Professor Sharon Parker. So the Good Work Design um, resources suite consists of 10 two to three minute videos on the themes um, what great managers do. And these are supported by more detailed web materials and better practice guidance. So all of the topics are there um, on the screen. We've also added a suite of Good Work Design micro learns that are freely available to, for all to use. The topics provide practical advice that address known risks to health and wellbeing, participation and productivity. This includes advice on behaviours that can help create psycho psychologically safe teams and better manage psychosocial risks at work. I'd like to note that compliance with work health and safety legislation is not a focus of the resources themselves. Our focus is on promoting better practice and, and, and encouraging use by uh, managers and supervisors. So what can this look like in practice? I have a brief case study on the slide featuring a worker with osteoarthritis. We've mapped some of the different good work design topics to this scenario so you can see how they can add value and help guide managers in providing good work that supports their um, staff's health and well-being. So Rob has a chronic condition called osteoarthritis that causes pain at times and can impact his functioning. It's critical that Rob's manager knows Rob well and understands both his challenges and what needs to be in place to support him. The Knowing Your Team and Supporting Return to Work resources can help Rob's manager with this. Knowing Rob well also helps um, his manager to identify what helps Rob to manage his work demands, including a clear written work plan and a plan for prioritising or sharing work during times of high demands. The Addressing Work Demands resource resources can step managers through this topic. Having access to flexible work arrangements that meet his needs is a key support for Rob and enables him to perform his work earlier in the day when he is feeling fresher and less likely to be experiencing pain. It also helps him manage his own health and well-being as well as his family responsibilities. Effective communication between Rob and his manager is fundamental. Rob's manager knows that regular and clear communication is important for Rob and that when Rob is quiet and withdrawn, it's a sign that more communication and potentially support is needed. So providing this type of support will facilitate continued participation and performance by Rob at work. So we believe that good work design resources have good potential to influence behaviour change. And we know from implementation science that this is not enough and that strategies to facilitate uptake of evidence-based practice into regular use are needed. To drive behaviour change and improve outcomes, uh, organisations need to integrate or embed good work design within systems, culture and management practices. This includes HR systems, learning and development systems, and also work health and safety management systems. We're currently focusing on raising awareness of the Good Work Design resources and discussing how these can be used by organisations. We are offering tailored presentations on Good Work Design for individual scheme organisations. So if you're interested in something like this, please contact Comcare and ask to speak to um, uh, one of the strategic programs team. We're also exploring how we can better support our scheme to implement Good Work Design into the future. Um, so if you'd like to find out a little bit more about Good Work Design, we actually have a QR code there on the screen um, at present. So you can have a, um, a quick look at, at this as well. And um, that will lead you through to uh, another, another link. And I'd just like to close by, you know, really reiterating um, you know, I suppose some of those key messages that addressing the psychosocial factors that are contributing to body stressing injuries is really important, uh, that we can use good work design to address both physical and psychosocial risks, and that there is, you know, it's good to have a focus on frontline manager and supervisor capability um, because they're often best placed to, to implement um, some of these activities. So I will um, pause there, um, but thank you. Great, thanks, Lynn. And we've popped the uh, results of that uh, poll into the chat there, which um, the far and away the leader, Lynn, is uh, computer and uh, desk work, uh, along with uh, poor work design and other uh, work demands, uh, followed by manual handling. So 
That's great. Well, I mean, poor work demand. There's a you know great uh, great segue there, isn't it? I think people recognise um, that that there is really an opportunity there. So thanks, Lynn. It was really helpful to know sort of some of the resources that are available for people to use in improving work design and assist in preventing body stressing or musculoskeletal uh, disorders. So as the final part of our webinar, I want to invite all of our speakers to uh, join me in a bit of a panel session. We will look to address some of the questions that have been put forward uh, through the registration process. Uh, but one that has come through uh, the chat a little bit, uh, and there's been a little bit of confusion about, was, um, uh, Lynn, you've sort of cited that, uh, and both um, Jody as well, you sort of mentioned that psychosocial hazards can lead to some of these musculoskeletal disorders, or there's this linkage there, but there might be some confusion about how that link necessarily connects. So I think people, some, some people can uh, probably appreciate that some uh, disorders are absolutely mechanical. You know, you can have a trip, slip and fall, and you know, it's a very physical um, uh, circumstance. Uh, they might also be able to appreciate that if they have limited control over their brakes or autonomy over how and when they do their works and um, the pressure that they're under might have those sort of physical factors. But in your slides, I also notice that maybe um, we could spell out um, how the kind of psychology can affect the biology uh, through some of those work pressures and things like that. Is that, to, is that directed to me, Andrew? Yes, yeah, Jodie. Yeah, 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 maybe yeah. if you could spell that out a little bit for us. And it looks like we might have uh, one of our first challenges with technology. Yeah. We've got a, a little hang up there with the, uh, the sound. Uh, hopefully no we're sound. Back again. Yeah, you're back again, Jodie. Thanks. Oh, good. Uh, we were going so well. Um, so exposure to the psychosocial hazards can uh, cause a stress response. So this is a physiological change. So if we measured what was happening at an internal level, we'd see, you know, if it was appropriate in workplaces, we would see a rise in the stress markers um, that uh, and the stress hormones. And so in triggering that stress response, at a, at a physiological level, so it's not in someone's head. This is a, a, a change uh, in, in uh, it's, this is a response to those hazards. This can influence the sort of um, inflammatory markers. It can influence the sort of tissue tensions that, that we have and uh, present as a physical disorder. So theoretically, you can be exposed to psychosocial hazards and you present with a sore neck. Right? No physical demand at all. More commonly, though, you're exposed to both, you know, static postures, deadlines, um, you know, no control um, and the sedentary posture. So it's, it's often that you're getting both. So you're getting that sort of stress response, that internal stress response, and you're getting that biomechanical load as well. But it, it, you, you equally, you can have both. You can have exposure to the, psychos the, the biomechanical load on its own and you can have exposure to the psychosocial factors on their own too, so. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jody. Yeah, and I think we can all kind of um, recognise that when you're feeling that sense of pressure for a deadline and uh, yeah. the shoulders and the neck start becoming tighter and tighter yeah. as uh, the deadline looms closer and closer. Thanks yeah. for that. Uh, so one of the first questions that we've got from the uh, registrations is around what sort of advice uh, do you have for an organisation that's struggling with the topic and wonder what they should be doing and where they could begin? So it might kick off with Mel, if you want to uh, give us any tips or pointers. I mean, I'll definitely come in with my um, my injury management bias, where I think it's not a bad place to start to look at what's going wrong. Um, so if you look at your injury management data, it will tell you um, where your injuries are coming from. Um, and uh, prevention's always uh, where we want to be. But I think it's not a bad place to start of going, where are my hotspots? Um, what, are, what are the key things that we're seeing going wrong that are leading to injuries? Um, I, I think it's not a bad place to start and, and work backwards from there. Um, again, that's my, uh, with my injury management hat on. Can, can I jump in, Andrew? Yeah. So uh, I, I, if you, I think the answer is, is, is it depends, and I think that's um, Melanie um, raises a good point. For some organisations, actually, uh, and their prevention, I, I, 
in an ideal world, I'd go prevention forward, and I, I'm pretty sure Melon would too. So, uh, f from uh, in Utopia, I would say let's 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 try and do hazard surveillance and identify when people are first have a niggle or a ache or a pain, and that that's certainly the sort of philosophy behind the Affirm Toolkit. But not all all organisations are there yet, and in that case, I say start with where you're at. And if the issue is that the injury rates are high, get them to focus on particular, um, you know, particular areas, and then try and upskill, um, you know, upskill the people that need to be upskilled. So whether that's the WHS professionals, the man the managers, the supervisors, and give them knowledge about what the issues are. And in doing that, you're trying to create their awareness and you go, oh, awareness, but you, you're trying to push them towards that action station. So I think of it in terms of the stages of change. You know, you're trying to move people along, but you've got to start where they're at. And if, it, if, it's, at the, if, if it's at the injury end, great, take that and run with it. You know, I, I'm not, not a purist or, you know, idealist, but in, in, in the best if you had, if everything was going well, go prevention forward. Thanks. And I, I think the other thing, you know, just in terms of, um, you know, resources, I mean, the hazardous manual task code of practice, obviously, in terms of specific guidance on how to identify and assess, you know, controls and review controls for hazardous manual tasks. So it's a good place to start. But we know that that's not very strong in terms of the psychosocial hazards. So something like the, you know, the model code of practice for managing psychosocial hazards at work, um, you know, is, is good to then have a bit of a look at in, in terms of actual documentation. And then obviously there's all the, the tools, you know, the firm tool um, that, that are out there that also provide some good guidance. Thanks. And so have you seen any examples of what's working out there where employers have put uh, interventions uh, into place uh, that's working well? I know, uh, Melanie, you'll have some examples of things that have actually been um, been done, but I might start with Jody, and then uh, we'll roll to Mel. Yeah, look, we've actually got some case studies on our website, so they provide some sort of concrete examples of where organisations have used the toolkit uh, and then what they've actually uh, what they've actually done. But I I would say the one thing, uh, if I go from the toolkit perspective, because we've interviewed people about, you know, what works and doesn't, is actually the consultation process. And so that cuts across some tools, not all, but some, in terms of the, the focus of the toolkit is to create a dialogue, a mechanism through which workers can engage meaningfully with um, with their uh, respective supervisors and managers, and the feedback we get is is a, a, around that, and that helps to drive those sustainable solutions. So where you see good consultation, whether it's through a firm or other tools, um, I think you get much better outcomes. And then there's much better acceptance than if they don't work. You know, if you put something in, it's like whatever. It doesn't doesn't actually solve the issue. Workers are more uh, a little bit more accommodating because they're like, well, they were part of it, you know, so they can't just push it back. It's my Thanks. Nelly? Um, I definitely would back that up. And um, as Jodie said, like if I use the example of um, like these strong arm straps that we developed for people to be able to pull more easily the curtains on trucks where we were seeing uh, a lot of injuries that was um, developed by our work health and safety teams and it's a fantastic resource but it probably wasn't done in a lot of consultation and that we have that disconnect between head office says x but where the people doing the work here and i think that had a big part to play with them when we went out and we said oh can we have a look at um how you use it and they're like oh we didn't even know we had them and then they were sitting in a box in an office somewhere and so i think um we had to sort of reverse engineer um, explaining to them why they were a good thing, um, what they could do biomechanically, how they worked, um, and then we started to get some traction. But um, yeah, it, it, it was around the wrong way. And the only other thing I'd probably add to that is that just the importance of of senior management buy-in, because um, I think it just gives everyone the permission to just constantly be having these um, conversations. You know, if they're coming up at every meeting and people know they're not going to get in trouble for raising things, and it's a lot more collegiate. But I think um, the consultation, but also getting that buy-in from all the different levels of management is is absolutely crucial. Yeah, thanks. Great point. 
Uh, and uh, you brought up a really interesting one around uh, consultation uh, and particularly around transport. Uh, I did mention that uh, last week we had a transport network forum. And if you didn't manage to get along to that, the recording is available. And there was a really interesting session by Lynn Fox on their 4D model of having safety conversations, which in the 4D stand for what's, uh, what's dumb, what's difficult, what's dangerous and what's different. And so they use that to kind of facilitate a dialogue uh, just to talk about what's happening in the workplace. And hence, for example, you know, you've got these safety straps and we don't know how to use them or uh, they don't you know, fit in a particular way. So it gives creates that opportunity to have the dialogue about, you know, what the reality of work versus the work as imagined and uh, have that opportunity to actually put some interventions in place. Jodie? Oh, I was just going to say that also um, Bronwyn Otto spoke at that transport forum and we have one remaining training session next week in uh, system thinking and um, uh, uh, psychosocial hazards. Uh, so there are still some places available and I think Brom put a QR code in the chat. Um, if so if you're in the transport sector and you meet the criteria, um, feel f we'd love to see you next week um, in the uh, uh, and if you just scroll back up, there'll be a QR code. Is that all right? That was, yep. you know, shameless recruitment there. But anyway, a shameless plug. No problem. No problem. Thanks. Um, and Lena, I might throw to you about um, who needs to be involved. Um, Mel mentioned um, executive being involved. How important is exec buy-in to get progress or support? Look, I think that it's really, it's really critical, um, you know, having that support and having that, you know, the, the culture in the organisation that this is really important and it's visible. I think the new psychosocial regulations um, are a really good opportunity to sort of um, gain more executive buy-in if you think it's lacking a little bit, um, you know, that making sure that people are aware um, of, of, you know, of the, the need to really address these, uh, the psychosocial hazards. Um, and so there, um, and there may be opportunities, I guess, to leverage this in ways that improve the body stressing outcomes um, that also give, um, you know, that also can be improved through addressing those psychosocial hazards um, um, so to reduce both the, the physical and the psychological issues within the workplace. Thanks. Um, oh, there's now the QR look, there's code. Been, oh, there's the QR code. Uh, thanks. Uh, there's, just, there's been a lot of talk about manual handling training not being the best approach to prevent musculoskeletal disorders or body um, stressing. Is there no longer a place for this type of training? Let's start with Jodie. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, in a nutshell, no. Um, there, is, uh, the, there is plenty of evidence to, to, to support that it doesn't work. That doesn't mean we don't need to train people. It's what we train them in. So in using, people need to know how to use equipment or things that are provided, you know, uh, to, to help uh, with their tasks. Um, so that sort of training absolutely has a role, as does hazard and risk identification uh, training. So we need to focus on that type of training. So we just need to be careful about the, the, the words, but teaching people how to lift with a technique thing, no place. And, yep. and I think there's a there's a statement actually on Comcare's uh, website as well, a bit of a statement around that generic how to lift training. You know, the evidence doesn't support it, but really more specific training um, and, and sort of the training, that, the things that Melanie sort of um, re, uh, spoken to as well. Yeah, that's really important. And, and also the aged care sector, some of the earlier work Jodie spoke about, um, again, specific and, and tailored and assessing a need. Mm. Yeah, great. Um, so you've got another question there about uh, what do you see the role of tools, such as a firm toolkit in managing psychosocial hazards and manual, manual handling? What are sort of the benefits and limitations of um, tools from a practical perspective? Uh, mm. To what extent can organisations rely on them? Mm. I think that's a good it, – it is, you know, okay, I, I have a, a, a bias, but I, I'm not, you know, if people are doing things, I'm, I, my, my mantra is getting people to do things. Um, and that that one mechanism is through that particular tool. Um, I think that the whole purpose of using a tool is to get good quality um, risk controls. And if you're not doing that, then the tool's not you. You can use any tool you like, 
but you've got to develop the risk controls, but then you have to implement them. So if you're not implementing risk controls that are of sufficient quality uh, and you're using a tool, it doesn't matter. It's a waste of time. So it's all about um, trying to drive that, um, I, I'll call it a systems thinking approach so that you're getting um, risk controls that are targeted at for for the at, in the organisation at the right place, um, and they're the right levels. So they're really looking at trying to sort of that elimination engineering. Um, to, if you use that terminology at that sort of level, not at training your individuals how to be resilient, eat more fruit, stop smoking, that sort of thing. We need to step away from that so people can hear my view on on those and focus on the systems of work, and then we'll start to drive. Uh, more change because we cannot change changing individuals behavior is really difficult and it's not actually really the role of the workplace yeah yeah thanks uh, we've got a couple more questions and we're running short of time but i'm going to try to squeeze a, a few in here because i think they're really valuable um, we have had quite a few questions about flexible workplace arrangements with more employees working remotely and from home than ever before um, any thoughts on what employers should do to sort of manage body stressing hazards or prevent um, MSD for so people working remotely uh, from the office? Lynn, do you want to kick off with this one? Uh, look, in the, interest, in, in the interest of time, um, Comcast actually recently published a literature review called Beyond the Office. Um, so this is considerations and practical approaches for working safely at home. And we can pop that in the, the chat as well. And that really explores a range of health and safety considerations and provide some advice on you know practical steps that employers and workers can take in relation to that home office um, or home offices and, and and so I'd really encourage you to perhaps have a quick look at at, at that. Yeah thanks. Uh, and why maybe for, sorry Jodie go on. We we published we probably published about a, a ten or so papers during the pandemic on working from home and the impacts uh, of that, and there's a there's a, a review uh, in, in one of those papers. So if you look on our website too, we've got some um, some papers around that. But I would also suggest that there is one of the things we need to do is to evaluate what new ways of working. There is a distinct lack of what does contemporary work look like in 2023 and moving forward, and the implications for that on people. We're using backward looking data at the minute and we need to be looking at more contemporary because it is there's a significant change it is it's difficult it's a difficult space yeah thanks jody um look there's also been quite a few questions come through both registration um and uh when people have been coming in about things like um mel you mentioned an aging workforce uh people have asked about sort of pre-existing conditions you know un younger workers who've sort of got a precondition or a um, preload from a lot of computer-based work already outside work um factors uh, sort of non-work related um conditions love your thoughts on how an employer should deal with that or thoughts around how employers are, are dealing with that is that just their problem or is that something employers really need to step into Mel? um Look, I, I definitely would want to say that um, as we have an ageing workforce, I wouldn't say that we're seeing more injuries from our older workers. Like often, um, you know, they've had injuries over their lifetime and they're actually quite good at managing it. Um, and sometimes we see with those younger workers, there's maybe a little bit more of a sense of a panic if they, you know, have a low back strain where they think, well, is that it for me now? I've got a, a low back injury. So I'm, I'm, look, I'm a big fan of taking a very holistic approach if I look at, how we manage from a, a rehabilitation perspective. If we just focus on the injury, um, we don't get nearly as good results. We've got to look at the whole person, um, and that includes uh, the mental and physical health that they came into employment with us in, um, how the injury is impacting them outside of work. Um, and we've, you know, we've run, a, we've run a study, quite comprehensive study within the business around um, early identification of what some of those barriers are outside of the injury. Um, and how, I did, how addressing them earlier on leads to much better um, uh, uh, recovery outcomes, but also much better outcomes um, from a financial perspective. Um, so yeah, I'm a. Uh, there's no, there's no point I, from my perspective. There's no point just focusing on the injury because um, yeah, it, it, it results just won't be as good. Thanks. 
Uh, so, and obviously, Comcare would uh, be very strong promoters of early intervention and uh, supporting their employees, regardless of um, where their condition um, is uh, coming from, and making reasonable adjustments, um, whatever that uh, support is. Um, look, we, we've um, actually already blown over a little bit with time, but I want to give an opportunity to the panel. If, any concluding comments you would like to um, wrap up on or with? No. Enough said. We did also have a number of questions I will point out about specific workstation setups and those sorts of things. There are some, and uh, requests for particular exercises or um, guidance around setting up desks. There is some guidance on Comcare's website, which we'll put in our links uh, that you'll be able to find through Comcare's website on some general guidance uh, around that. Uh, so uh, we won't go into that in any detail at this stage. So. Now, as we now come to the end of the time, on behalf of all of us, I'd really like to thank all of our presenters. Thank you so much for giving up your time, joining us today. We really appreciate it. We really hope that you, for the audience, it's provided you with some um, insights and some key takeaways. Your feedback is absolutely critical to us. It really shapes the way that we deliver these events and provides input into uh, the themes and the topics we present on. So a short evaluation survey is going to be sent to all the attendees straight after the event. We've got a link um, in there. Oh, there's a little poll up there as well, uh, which is around what resources, guidance and supports would help you to prevent, manage um, body stressing in the workplace. So feel free to um, post training recommendations. Great. I can see a few people are already putting in there. So thank you. Uh, we also have that QR code for uh, uh, our survey, which you'll be able to provide more comprehensive feedback in. So please uh, really encourage you to do that. This is our final um, event for Safe Work Month for Comcare. So we really hope you take the time that um, the event has had an impact for you and there's been some good takeaways and it's the start of some important conversations. Uh, if you want to stay in touch with Comcare and the work that we're doing, including events, guidance and resources, be sure to subscribe to our e-news uh, and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, the links are in the chat section now. Thanks for joining us. Uh, have a great day and stay safe, folks.